let's begin. Yes. What are we talking about when we talk about the new Ukraine? Ukraine has this glorious cultural past. Which, by the way, was not a Russian construction, but a Norseman construction. The war consists of Russian aggression, but most importantly, it consists of Ukrainian resistance. No one ever expected Ukrainians to be so united fighting the aggressor. I mean, these are very tough guys, right? Freedom. Freedom uh, as a value which you are ready to, to die for. We want Ukraine to win. It could end this year. Hello and welcome to the 2023 Kyiv Jewish Forum hosted by the Jewish Confederation of Ukraine and Tablet Magazine. Now comes a sit-down interview with former head of the CIA and U.S. Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta. Stay with us. <music> Welcome back to the 2023 Kiev Jewish Forum. I'm Jeremy Stern, deputy editor of Tablet Magazine. I'm very pleased to be here today with Leon Panetta, former U.S. Secretary of Defense and former director of the CIA. He's also served as the White House Chief of Staff and a longtime congressman from the Central Coast of California, where he is now chairman of the Panetta Institute at California State University, Monterey Bay. So Secretary Panetta, welcome and thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Jeremy, it's uh, great to be with you, and uh, I want to uh, commend uh, the Jewish Federation, Confederation uh, of Ukraine for putting uh, these kinds of forums together uh, and really building international support for uh, what Ukraine, the war that uh, Ukraine is fighting for all of us. Great. Well, thanks very much. Let's uh, jump right in. Um, so first question. I think a lot of our audience today is by now well aware of the scale of military aid the United States and our NATO partners are providing to Ukraine. For obvious reasons, we hear a lot less about the role played by US intelligence in the war. In the last uh, few weeks, though, we've seen at least some stories about how, for example, maybe grid coordinates for strikes on Russian army positions, et cetera, are provided by US personnel outside of Ukraine. I, I sell that to ask, you know, to the extent possible, can you give us uh, a, a better sense of the role U.S. and other NATO intelligence are playing in the war? And does it suggest to you that we're an even more active participant on behalf of Ukraine than the provision of ammunition and weapon systems and such alone would, would suggest? Well, I, I don't think uh, there's any question that uh, uh, our intelligence uh, agencies are, are very much involved uh, in uh, supporting uh, Ukraine. Uh, some of this obviously is classified, but uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, the CIA and uh, other critical agencies are providing on a regular basis uh, important intelligence uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and that uh, more importantly, uh, the CIA provided a very important intelligence to the world when Putin was deciding whether or not he would invade Ukraine. Uh, the fact that, uh, that we provided that intelligence to the world, that in fact Putin was preparing for an invasion, and that what he was saying about not invading Ukraine was a lie, uh, I think that was critical to showing uh, the fact that uh, Putin was being devious uh, and uh, was lying to the world about uh, his intention to go into Ukraine. So uh, that role by intelligence uh, is frankly something new because normally we, we hold that kind of intelligence very close. But the fact that we were able to provide that intelligence to the world, I think really educated the world as to what Putin was really up to in invading the Ukraine. Yeah, another question about that episode from, I guess, almost exactly a year ago. Um, so so the audience knows what, what you're referring to. In the, in the run-up to the war, the United States sort of broke the mold by 
publicizing or revealing a, a bit of intelligence about Russia's invasion plans. And it seemed like this really did succeed not only in preempting some Russian disinformation about the coming invasion, but maybe also helped build uh, NATO support for a coalition against Russia at a critical hour. Um, at, at the same time, when you talk to some of our friends in Ukraine, something you, you hear uh, often or maybe heard more last year is that not only was the intelligence provided just shockingly accurate, but there was also a belief uh, in Washington, but by no means only in Washington, kind of everywhere around the world, that the Russians were going to maybe win the war fairly quickly and that this combination of the novel intelligence approach with pulling diplomats out of Kiev, et cetera, was maybe a, a not the optimal policy mixture. I mean, what do you make of that whole episode and the unique way in which U.S. intelligence was used and revealed at the time? It seems like an important moment in history. Well, one thing I've learned as a former CIA director uh, is that um, there are lessons to be learned when it comes to intelligence. Uh, and there are lessons to be learned here. Because the reality is that not only was Putin wrong uh, in uh, his assessment that uh, the Russian forces would be able to move very quickly and capture Kiev within a couple days, but the reality is that even our own intelligence, which was estimating that uh, the Russians had overwhelming force uh, and could in fact move quickly, uh, that intelligence, uh, frankly, was not uh, spot on. Uh, it, uh, it missed, and I think we all missed, the fact that the Russian military of, of Putin is not the Russian military that we've seen in the past. Uh, its command and control had been weakened. Uh, using conscripts, uh, had not been very effective. They were not well trained. Uh, the weaponry was out of date uh, and not uh, not able to to be used in a way that would be effective. The logistics were bad, and so when you put all those pieces together, uh, the Russian military was not uh, the strong military that we assumed. Uh, Putin would have put together. Uh, and so everybody needs to learn the lesson, uh, even in assessing military might throughout the world, whether we're talking about China, or whether we're talking about Iran, or whether we're talking about North Korea, or whether we're talking about the United States. I think, I think it's very important to make sure that whatever assessment we have of the strength of that country is one that is backed up by intelligence, not just from satellites, very frankly, but from human intelligence on the ground that can more accurately assess uh, the real strength of a military force. Right. So a kind of related question, but the, the war has seen a pattern in which the Ukrainians ask for certain weapon systems that the United States is kind of initially reluctant to supply, but which for the most part, we, we eventually provide incrementally over time, presumably in order to avoid the impression of, of a rapid escalation with Russia. So we saw this with HIMARS and most recently tanks. Next, maybe it's fighter jets or ATACMs or what have you. What's your sense of what's Ukraine asking for right now that we're not providing? And in your opinion, are we moving too fast? Are we moving too slow? Or is it just right? Is it kind of perfectly responsible? I, th I think it's uh, very important, uh, particularly at this critical time, because uh, I think we've reached a, a point in this war that I would call probably the, the third stage of this war. First stage was the invasion. We were successful in stopping the invasion. Uh, the second stage was this war on terror that uh, Russia engaged in killing innocent men, women, and children, trying to break the will of the Ukrainian people and trying, frankly, to break the will of the United States and NATO. Uh, and that was not successful. Uh, and then, obviously, the Ukrainians were successful at conducting uh, an offensive that moved Russia out of some of the areas they had been able to, to conquer. 
Uh, we're now in somewhat of a stalemate. Everybody acknowledges that. Uh, but stalemates can be dangerous. Uh, I'm a believer as a former Secretary of Defense that there's probably no such thing as a stalemate in war. You're either winning or you're losing. Uh, I think the Russians are using this period to try to reinforce their forces, trying to dig in and trying to develop an, uh, an offensive uh, against uh, Ukraine. I think it's very critical that Ukraine be given whatever assistance they need, not only to stop the Russian offensive, but to be able to put together an offensive of their own that pushes the Russians back uh, out of the Donbass and ultimately out of Crimea as well. To do that, obviously they need tanks, they need to have ammunition, they need to have air defense systems, they need to have uh, the kind of long range missile systems that they're going to require in order to defend themselves. Uh, and lastly, I think they do need uh, airplanes. They need fighter planes uh, to be able to provide a full array of the weapon systems that will allow them to defend themselves at this crucial time. So I'm hopeful that the United States and NATO uh, recognizing that this is a critical moment. I, I think 2023 is going to ultimately decide what happens in Ukraine. Uh, and in order to make sure that Ukraine maintains the momentum, I think right now Russia's losing. But in order for Russia to continue to lose, we need to make sure that Ukraine is fully prepared, fully armed, uh, and fully capable of being able not only to defend themselves, but to conduct an offensive against Russia. Because I think the goal here is to force Putin uh, into one of two positions, either acknowledging defeat in the Ukraine or willing to sit down and negotiate some kind of resolution. That is the goal that I think we all ought to be unified on. And to make that goal happen, we have to make sure that Ukraine has all of the weapons they need in order to be able to not just defend themselves, but to conduct an offensive. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, just to drill down on that, on that last point a little more, I mean, what's your sense of what end results? And I know this is a difficult one, but what end result is the U.S. trying to achieve or, or should we be trying to achieve? Is it a clear Ukrainian victory, including the reclamation of all previously lost territories? It is it a negotiated settlement that might unfortunately have to include the permanent loss of some territory? Is it more important to get guarantees of accession to NATO or the EU? Or is it waiting out the current regime in Moscow? I mean, these are a, a lot of different possibilities you hear mentioned often. I, what do you think is the, the ultimate end result that, would, that the U.S. should be trying to pursue? I, I think uh, the ultimate goal here uh, has to be to make sure that Putin fails uh, in his mission to take over the Ukraine. Uh, and look, uh, having having seen Putin for, for a while, there is only one thing that will force Putin to ultimately recognize the situation he's in, and that's force. That's the only language that Putin understands. And so I think we ought to conduct this war and help the Ukraine conduct this war in a way that makes clear that Ukraine is going to seek the ultimate defeat of Russia. And so that they're able to push them back not only out of the Donbass, but out of the Crimea as well. In other words, we ought to approach this on the basis that we are going to defeat the Russians and push them out of Ukraine. Uh, that ought to be the approach. And if we're successful in ways that make clear that uh, Ukraine has the offensive here, I think ultimately Putin then will have to decide 
whether or not to accept defeat, as I said, or whether to engage in some kind of negotiation. And if there is that negotiation, Ukraine will be negotiating from a position of strength. That should be the goal. Because ultimately, the final decision rests with Ukraine as to what ultimately they have to agree to in order to achieve peace. Right, right. You mentioned Crimea a couple of times. We we also had the pleasure of interviewing General Ben Hodges at the Kiev Jewish Forum. And he also argues quite forcefully for, for what he sees as the strategic necessity of enabling Ukraine to, to retake Crimea and, and liberate it from Russian occupation. Um, now, you left the government, I believe, uh, about a year before the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014. But what's your sense of the role that episode played in U.S. policy planning at the, at the time and since? I mean, was it seen as an isolated incident that could hopefully be confined to that part of Eastern Europe? Or was it seen as part of a, a, a larger strategic picture in which the United States also had to think about uh, what it was doing or at least trying to do with Russia in terms of cooperation uh, elsewhere, for example, in Syria, in, in the nuclear negotiations with Iran, et cetera? What, what's your sense of the way that played out? I think uh, history has told us that when you're dealing with a bully, uh, the best way to deal with a bully is from strength. Because otherwise, bullies will take advantage of weakness. That's what tyrants do, going back to Hitler. They'll take advantage of weakness. Uh, and I think that's what Putin has done. I think Putin sensed weakness on the part of the United States and of our allies. Uh, he was able to go into the Crimea, and he didn't pay a price. He was able to go into Georgia, uh, into Syria, into Libya, and he didn't pay a price. He was able to conduct a very sophisticated and bold uh effort, cyber effort, to try to undermine uh, our election systems in this country. Uh, and indeed, uh, there was some success in creating confusion uh, within our own system. And he didn't really pay a price. So I really think Putin, when it came to Ukraine, did not really believe that the United States or our allies would in fact come together and try to stop him, and that he would be successful at being able to achieve a quick victory. I think when you're dealing with somebody like Putin, you've got to show him that there is a line he cannot cross. And so I commend President Biden, I commend our allies in NATO for coming together in a unified way uh, and saying to Putin, if you do this, you're going to pay a price. We're going to implement strong sanctions against you. We're going to provide weapons and training to the Ukrainians. We're going to reinforce NATO. And we've taken all of those steps. But more importantly, we have provided the weapons and the assistance needed so that a Ukrainian force that is proven to be courageous and dedicated and some of the best fighters in the world have been able to stand up uh, and defend their country. So I, I think that it's a lesson again, that in dealing with bullies like Putin, uh, you've got to be able to deal with them from strength. By the way, I think the message that we're sending as a result of this war in the Ukraine which I think is extremely pivotal. This is a pivotal war because what happens in the Ukraine sends a message not just to Putin, it sends a message to Xi in China with regards to Taiwan. It sends a message to Kim Jong-un in North Korea about uh, whether or not the world will react to stop him if he tries to take a, an aggressive move. Move And it sends an important message to the supreme leader in Iran 
Uh, so this is this is perhaps the most important war we are facing in the 21st century because ultimately it will decide not only whether we protect democracy in Ukraine, but whether we are able to protect democracies in the 21st century. Okay, well, two final questions and one uh, about our allies, which you just mentioned. Uh, so it seems like one of the consequences of, of the first year of the war uh, that maybe seemed unimaginable uh, beforehand, you see, um, you know, Germany has its own problems with its own army and, and, and uh, defense spending and whatnot, but it did eventually find a way to lift objections, its previous objections to allowing the provision of German-made tanks to be used in Ukraine. There is talk about them taking a more active role, moving closer to the United States. You hear a lot of talk about the kind of center of gravity in NATO moving perhaps towards Poland, the Baltics, I mean, Northern European countries, and away from the Western part of Europe that we're used to thinking of as, as, as the strongest part of Europe. Also, maybe a downstream effect, Japan taking its defense more seriously watching what's happened in Ukraine, seeing what the U.S. is willing to do if you're willing to, 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 to take a lot of the responsibility yourself. What do you see as the kind of uh, immediate and medium-term future of the U.S. alliance system in Europe and elsewhere as, as a result of this war? Are, are, we, are they even more dependent on us than they used to be? Do you see them taking a more active role than they have in the past? How do you, how do you see it? Well, you know, I, lo I look at the world that uh, we have today, and I see a very dangerous world that has a lot of flashpoints, a lot of flashpoints, uh, probably more flashpoints in the world today than we've seen since World War II, uh, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's North Korea, whether it's Iran, whether it's terrorism, whether it's cyber war, which is increasing all the time. Uh, and my sense is that if we're going to provide security in that kind of world, that the United States has to be a world leader. And I'm, I'm proud of the fact that uh, Biden said that the United States is going to restore its role as world leader. We have to be a world leader, very frankly, because if we don't lead the world, nobody else will. Nobody else will. But at the same time, the only way we're going to be able to deal with these threats that I talked about is through building alliances. We've got to build alliances with other countries that are willing to work with us in order to make sure that tyrants don't prevail. Uh, so the example of the United States and NATO coming together in a unified way, which is not easy. And I don't pretend that this is easy. I. I've been in NATO meetings. Uh, everybody usually used to give talking points. Everybody in the end tried to protect their own country. Uh, that's all understandable. But the fact that they were willing to come together, to join together in a unified way, was absolutely critical here. And having Germany participate and Britain participate and other countries and Poland, and others, NATO countries come together uh, I think has been absolutely essential to our ability to have Ukraine in a position where they could literally not only stop an invasion, but defeat Putin. I think the same approach needs to be taken elsewhere. I think in the Middle East, for example, in dealing with terrorism and Iran, I think the United States has to build an alliance not only of modern Arab countries, but with Israel working together to provide security, working together to deal uh, with, uh, with the challenges in that part of the world. Uh, that makes a great deal of sense because we're all facing common enemies there and we ought to work together. Same thing in, is true in China. Our ability to work with Japan, with South Korea, with Australia, with the so-called Quad, Australia and India, 
uh, I think has been absolutely important to our ability to confront China. Uh, China doesn't have allies, to be frank. Uh, and uh, they know that if the United States can build a strong alliance working with our Asian allies, that that's the best way to confront China. Same thing is true, not only dealing with China, dealing with North Korea. So whether it's there, whether it's Latin America or Central America, whether it's Africa, whether it's the Middle East, I think the key to the future is the ability of the United States to be able to work with our allies and to build a unified approach to providing security and confronting uh, our adversaries. Uh, I think that can happen. I really do. It's going to take a lot of work. It takes a lot of diplomatic work, but it's also going to take a strong military presence. If we maintain a strong military, then I think that will give us additional leverage to be able to build the kind of security that we need to build in the 21st century. So what we're going through now with the Ukraine is an example of what we're going to have to do with regards to other tyrants that we're dealing with in the world. Okay, well, final question before we let you go, and it's uh, it's one that kind of touches on or ties together everything uh, that you just spoke about. Um, so for a while, Ukraine seemed like one of the few maybe durable bipartisan issues in the United States. And to a certain extent, I think, I, I think that's still true, but in early 2023, we do hear a little bit more talk of Ukraine fatigue or fear of it becoming a wedge issue as U.S. electoral politics start to ramp up again with a presidential election coming up, uh, which is never far away. I mean, what do you see as the major factors determining continued bipartisan U.S. support for Ukraine over the next one to two years? I, I think the critical factor is whether Ukraine can maintain the momentum, uh, can, can be in a position of winning this war, uh, and ultimately, as I said, defeating Putin. If Ukraine is successful in that effort, then mark my words, uh, the world will remain unified in support of, of, uh, of Ukraine. If for some reason, this war should go into a long stalemate, uh, or it should be a protracted war that goes on a year, two years, three years into the future, uh, then make no mistake about it, it'll begin to undermine. There'll be cracks uh, in the unity that we have today. But the best way to maintain that unity is to show that we can win. That's, that's the best way to be able to hold the United States and our allies together. Because ultimately, as I said, uh, Ukrainians are fighting a war on our behalf. Their ability to defeat Putin, to show that they can stand up to Putin, is very frankly on behalf of not only the Ukraine, it's on our behalf as well. And we that's what has to keep us unified. And frankly, I think it's true even for the politics here in America. Uh, which, as we know, uh, can can go back and forth. But right now we have a strong, in, in a polarized political situation in this country, we have, I believe, strong unity between Republicans and Democrats in support of Ukraine. And I think the only way you maintain that is to show that because of our aid and assistance, because of what we're able to do to support Ukraine, we are defeating an adversary. We're defeating Putin. Putin. Putin represents a threat, not just to Ukraine, but to the United States. And our ability to be able to ultimately show that Putin can fail is in our security interest for the future. So I, I think it, it, it's, it's like everything else. Winning has a lot of friends, losing, uh, is a good way to lose all your friends. So I think continuing to win is the key to our ability to succeed. 
Well, on that note, I want to thank Secretary Leon Panetta on behalf of everybody at the Key of Jewish Forum for 2023. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you very much, Jeremy. It's really, it's been uh, my honor to have this opportunity. And again, uh, thank you and thank uh, the JCU for all it does uh, to try to promote unity on behalf of Ukraine. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you.